Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our latest edition of Scenarios for a Post-Pandemic Future, where we have a selection of the authors from the book talking about their chapters and discussing some of the deeper ideas, beliefs and behaviours that sit behind them. Uh, this week, I'm delighted to have with us Nell Watson, Julia Hollenbury, Steve Wells and Morgan Kaufman. And they're going to introduce themselves in a session in a second. But just to get us going, I thought I would, for those that don't know anything about the book, and there must be one or two people on the planet that still fall under that category, I'm just going to take you through a little overview of the book uh, while we're waiting for some uh, final participants to join us. Um, the book was published on June the 1st, and today we have a panel, as I say, each of them sharing one of the, uh, the chapters in the book, talking about the underlying ideas, and then getting into some deeper discussion. We also have some polling questions. Um, just a reminder, the book is divided into four sections. So the first section, and we've had a couple of webinars about this now, are uh, really looking at some of the big shifts and scenarios that map out how our world might evolve. So we, Steve's gonna talk a bit about one of those in a, a little while. Uh, we have Sahel Inutula who outlined six possible dialogues or narrative frames through which we can look at the future uh, as we head through the pandemic and beyond. Lisa Lotlingso, a futurist from Denmark, talks about how we should be looking at this opportunity as, as a chance to really test ideas from the future. Um, because we've had time at home, the home has become a, a kind of laboratory for ideas of the future. Miranda Mante, uh, futurist from, the, from Canada, explores a number of interesting ideas around the kind of shifts going on with technology, with government behavior, with supply chains that are, you know, a product, if you like, of the pandemic and this, this unseen enemy that we're fighting. Then Sheila Moorcroft outlines five key ways that she thinks that life could be different. Sheila's a, a futurist from the UK. Uh, then we have Jerry Edling, who's a broadcaster from the US, who talks about the potential for reinventing the way we innovate globally and also very new models that might emerge for healthcare solutions by 2035. Paul Plant, uh, a strat strategic uh, advisor from the UK talks about uh, what are some of the potential silver linings that there might be coming out of this crisis and changes in the way we behave, the way we run organizations, the way we interact with each other. And Bruce Lloyd lays down a, a manifesto. Um, Bruce is a professor from South Bank University in London and he talks about the potential for a new Marshall Plan for the planet uh, and a new beverage plan. Beverage wrote a policy paper in the UK in, during the Second World War, which laid down the foundations for the welfare state. And he's talking about the potential to create something that is a Marshall Plan and a beverage plan for the whole planet. So how do we really move the planet forward in a more caring and humanistic way? Um, we're gonna hear from Nell today about her chapter. We also have a really interesting chapter from uh, Catherine and Mike from the Australia and New Zealand Policing Authority, who talk about some of the changes that we might start to see in policing behavior as a result of the changes in social behavior and government policy coming out of the pandemic. Uh, Morgan, again, is gonna talk us through his chapter so shortly, and so is Julius. I won't steal their thunder at all. Uh, the final set of chapters in, in that section uh, Sylvia Galluser, a French futurist from the US, talks about a scenario uh, set in the future, 15 years into the future, where the Zoomer generation who are born during lockdown, or conceived during lockdown, I should say, uh, are being taught in the classroom, and it's that exploration of the changes that have happened, the changes in society's behavior and relationships, and the kind of things that get unve unveiled by a teacher talking to a generation who've only known post-pandemic life. Joe Tankersley, a futurist from the US, looks at a scenario of what might happen if we call an end to the pandemic too quickly. And then Alex from our team, our foresight director, 
looks at some of the shifts that are happening in terms of the way we use our homes and what that could imply for the future. And then uh, we have a section looking at government and the economy. We talk about some of the things that futurists have been talking to governments about for a long time and how we might want to build those into policy so we don't get fooled again in the future. We don't make the kind of mistakes we've made this time in many countries. Uh, David Wood talks about the potential for a more foresight-based approach to policy as well and how do we make sure that we really embed foresight into all of the ways in which we run a country. And Jeff Mulgan looks at, uh, Jeff is a professor of uh, social innovation from University College London. He looks at some of the changes that have happened during the pandemic in terms of the way governments have interacted with their citizenry and the way they've used technology. And what are some of the possibilities for the future that emerge from that? In that section, we also have a really interesting chapter from Bronwyn Williams, an econ economist and futurist from South Africa, who looks at the kind of divides that might be exacerbated both within society and between nations. Lee Shup, uh, a design thinker and futurist from the US, paints a picture of four different possible scenarios of what might happen to the US, depending on the evolution of the pandemic, the economy, and the outcome of the next election in the US, or the next presidential election. And then we lay down five big economic shifts that we think are critical for a more sustainable future. And then the final section looks at business and technology. Tom Cheeswright, a UK futurist, uh, paints a compelling argument for why we might not uh, move to a world where everyone is working from home in the future, and what are the, the social drivers in particular that might want us make us want to go back to the workplace. Alida Drought, a futurist from the US, looks at some of the transformative behaviors that might change within organizations to become, again, more human, more caring, more socially focused businesses. And then Robert Caldera, look, uh, another futurist from the US, looks at some of the shifts that were already taking place around technology and the organization of work and how they might get accelerated and a scenario set a few years ahead where a lot of those changes have happened, have happened and what that world could look like. And finally, in that section, uh, Roberto Soracco, uh, an advisor on digital technology, looks at personal digital twin technology and how that could be accelerated by the pandemic. And we close that out, that section out with a view of some of the shifts we're already starting to see in business and work and how those could play out long term. And we then conclude with what we see as a change agenda for a post-pandemic world, really picking up 10 key ideas from across all the other chapters, uh, laying down a manifesto for how do we make the world a more sustainable place and a better place for humanity. So that's a very quick tour through the book. Um, just a reminder of some forthcoming events if you want to get your cameras out and take a picture. Uh, we have the Recovery Summit coming up on June the 15th. That's a five-day program. Um, and uh, an incredible array of future thinkers talking about how do we address the recovery. Uh, next Saturday, we're doing something for people who've lost their jobs and uh, how do they start to look for the opportunities in the pandemic. Next Sunday, we have the second part of the society and social policy chapters with Sylvia, Joe, Alex and Lee all talking. Uh, June the 18th, we, we come back to our Thursday evening slots for the aftershocks and opportunity sessions, where we'll look at the future of artificial intelligence. And then two weeks after that, we'll focus on the future of financial services, banking and insurance. So a very packed agenda coming up. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, the book came out on the 1st of June. Uh, for those attending this webinar, there is a 30% pre-launch discount. It's selling well seems to have got quite a lot of nice media coverage uh, and a lot of requests for the various contributors to the book to speak at different events around the world. So that's really encouraging. So that's my fairly quick tour of the book. Um, and now I'm going to go around the panel and ask each of you to just introduce yourselves briefly. Morgan, if you could get your video up, that would be great so we can see you. But let's start with right. you. Let's start with you now. Just 15 seconds to introduce yourself who you are, what you do. Uh, hello, I'm yeah, Morgan. I'm a... 
Well, I'm a freelance with? forecaster, systems modeler, data scientist, and public policy analyst. Uh, I've graduated from the Houston Foresight Department and have done work in all of those areas over the last 10 years. Uh, my current project is updating the classic textbook systems one and two for the modern day and getting it out on Amazon. Great. Nell. Hi there. Um, Nell Watson. I'm AI faculty at Singularity University. I've been doing a lot of work with the IEEE to help to embed ethics into uh, autonomous systems and AI. I do a lot of work with uh, organizations such as ethicsnet.org and uh, culturalpeace.org to try to make the world um, a little uh, more reformable in hopefully the right direction. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Julia, let's go to you next. Um, I'm something of an expert on living well with fear. I was born traumatised and spent decades learning how to survive while feeling unsafe. Today, I'm an author, facilitator and therapist specialising in confidence and self-authority, living from body, heart and soul. And this is the rich way of life, I believe, everyone can benefit from individually and collectively as we create our shared future. Excellent, thank you. And Steve. Hi, so I'm Steve Wells. I'm a futurist. I work in with a particular interest in trying to understand how new technologies can be developed and deployed to create a more human-centered uh, future. And I do that through keynote speaking, through some strategy support work, and designing and developing workshops. Excellent. Okay, well, let's dive straight in to, to you now. Why don't you take a seven or eight minutes to tell us about the, the core ideas in your chapter, and then we'll have a broader chat around those topics. Certainly. So, so my, my chapter, Retroshock, looks at a kind of a retrospective from an imagined future around about 2080 or so, looking back on our present and understanding some of the elements which coincided to make these times so special, but which led to a greater outcome than otherwise we, we might have enjoyed. And I observe that at different times throughout history, we have endured very difficult and challenging times and yet have come out of them stronger and with societies which have more capabilities within them. For example, about 70,000 years ago with the, the Toba explosion, a lot of early humans faced tremendous hardship and they had to adapt very quickly to changing climactic situations and find new ways to resolve disagreements and to share resources more equitably and uh, trade across a great distance despite very uh, difficult um, weather patterns. And from that, it seems as if our species developed new capabilities for language and culture and trading of goods and the essence of art and economics and so many different aspects of modern life that we take for granted seem to emerge in that period in our deep ancestry. And if we fast forward to the um, 13th and 14th centuries when, when the Black Death was uh, ravaging through Europe, up to 50% of the people in the continent of Europe were killed by that disease. And that led to tremendous changes in how society functioned. A lot of the old uh, assumptions of how certain hierarchies were to be suddenly became erased. People became freer. They were able to pursue new opportunities. And it led to a rapid renaissance within society. People became very interested in the arts and culture and history and what had gone before. And they also started to question the established dogmas and doctrines and started to ask, uh, why are things done in a certain way? And that led to a wave of reformations and those were very challenging and sometimes painful. But it led to 
the Renaissance and it led to an end to a period of, of darkness that had lasted centuries. And it seems as if we may be in a similar time today, in our times now, when we face a series of, of crises, not just the pandemic, but also uh, resource crises, uh, climactic and environmental crises, as well as social crises as well. A lot of things seem to be whipping up into a great tempest. And yet I believe that I think we can move past this and become stronger. But perhaps this will be the warning shot across our bows, which obliges us to try new things in a new way, which points out that some of the financialization of the economy, which has occurred in the last 50 years or so, may be taking us down a dark path, which helps to point out that perhaps one of the greatest failures of our time is an ability to properly account for shifted costs and the fragility which has been created by globalization has not been paid for despite the greater efficiencies of that having been enjoyed. And it seems as if that perhaps now we may have an opportunity, a good excuse as well as the momentum to embrace that energy to reform society in new ways. And I believe that we will come out of it stronger in the end. I think this is going to lead us to a, a U catastrophe where we have an opportunity to arise from these troubles like the Phoenix and to embrace a new kind of Renaissance, a new kind of enlightenment, some kind of way of enjoying our cake uh, and eating it too in a sustainable manner. That's why I believe that this, these times may lead us to a much brighter future than otherwise possible. Thank you, Neil. Um, let's just uh, take a couple of questions first. Um, so you set out a very compelling argument for, for why this might be possible. As you look around you today, uh, in all those domains that you talked about, the social, the political, the economic, what do you see as the, the bright early indicators of hope that things might be changing? What gives you the most encouragement as you scan the world around you right now? I think a lot of us have had time to smell the roses, so to speak, during our our time, for most of us anyway, not all of us, but for many of us at least, um, having an enforced time of, uh, of doing things differently, of not traveling so much, of seeing more of our families and our pets, of yearning to be out in nature and not so much just taking it for granted, of having an experience of a paradoxically faster and slower life one which embraces digital and telecommuting technologies in new ways, and yet also is one where we may be baking our own sourdough bread for the first time and discovering just how nice uh, home-cooked meals are compared to the processed stuff that we used to eat for mere convenience. And I think that as well, we are experiencing, of course, tremendous tumult in society. A lot of that has been brought by economic concerns, which are bringing old social tensions back to the fore. And we've also seen some of the failures of our uh, most esteemed institutions. Um, our, our great health institutions in the world globally have had some successes, but also many failures during these times. And it seems as if that um, just as the League of Nations was a good attempt, but not quite good enough, when, uh, when the crunch time came, and then we reformed that and created the United Nations. I think we are now in a time of discovering that um, the, the organizations that were set up in the wake of the Second World War may not necessarily have the right structure to take us into the 21st. But at least now we're able to perceive that and we're able to consider what must come next. How can we reform these and create new institutions which are more decentralized, more democratized, more accountable? And I think that those institutions will help to 
build a sustainable future in the decades to come. Thank you. Um, just staying on that issue of institutions, uh, this last week, obviously, we've seen a wave of protests around the world, which you can you can interpret at multiple levels, whether it's just the issue of not just, but, you know, the, the core issue that people have taken to the streets on around uh, the treatment of black people by the police and by the system. But then, you know, people are weaving in broader issues about the design of societal systems, governance systems, the, the way resources are allocated in society. And it's, it seems to, in the course of 10 or 12 days, it exploded into something much bigger as a movement for change. Which do you see as the systems that are ripest for change and, and, and could be most susceptible to change in, in the wake of both the pandemic and these protests? What, what could give first? Where could we see the earliest signs of positive change? That's a great question. I think one of the most pressing issues on people's minds right now relate to economics, relate to having uh, security and, and safety. And I can expect that we will see a, a lot of uh, reforms of the institutions, especially in countries like the US, um, which has lagged behind the rest of the world in, in some respects with regards to um, universalized healthcare, etc. And hopefully we'll see an embrace of uh, a softer policing style, which returns to the, the traditional Peelian principles um, uh, from, from the, uh, the, the British policing system from, from the Victorian age, but which have uh, aged exceptionally well in that time since. I think that, that economics as well as justice, our, our judicial system and correctional system are some of the areas of society which are perhaps um, most necessitating change. I think we may see an end to the drug war and, and a, a significant end to drug prohibition in many countries, especially because we've seen examples from Portugal where drug prohibition has essentially been, been lifted. It's been become a, a medical and social issue rather than a criminal one. And the results of that have been fantastic. And so I think that the time is now for a, a domino effect, I suppose, of hopefully not revolutions, but rather um, small scale spirited reformations. That's what I would prefer to see, I think. I really like that term of small scale spirited reformations. It feels, feels appropriate for the world we're in. I'm going to do two things. Firstly, I'm going to encourage the participants uh, to make sure that you put questions into the Q&A box and vote for the questions you'd most like to hear each panelist answer. Uh, I've seen one in the chat box and I've asked the questioner to put it in the Q&A box just so others can vote on it. But now we, we've got a polling question from Nell. So let's get that on the screen. Uh, and whilst we're responding to the polling question, um, which asks what may be the best thing that, to take away from the crisis of 2020, and you can choose more than one option. Uh, I want to bring in the rest of the panel now, uh, including you, Morgan, if you could activate your screen. Uh, and let's just go around and take uh, initial reactions from each of you to what Nell had to say. And I'm going to start with you, Steve, for this one. Um, what were your, your reactions to, to what you heard from Nell? I think the thing that resonated most strongly with me was the question of reforming institutions. Uh, and that particularly overlapped with some of the things that, uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later on. And, and I start to expand some of those initial ideas uh, like health, um, like internal security, so policing, uh, onto some of the other things that I, I like to talk about more broadly as a futurist which include things like education, 
uh, and how we create a more human sense of education rather than a kind of a, a STEM focus, which out of necessity, I guess, has been our focus for several decades now. But it, you know, that's one of the critical areas that I think we need to pay attention to. And, and you know, if I kind of sum up what I heard Nell say there, it seems to really overlap with the notion of a more human future. And, and that's clearly one of the things, one of the critical things, if not the most critical thing that we talk about there. How do we use education as a way of helping people live fulfilling lives in a future where automation may be taking the things away from us, our jobs that have typically been the, rock, the bedrock of how we live, or how we survive, um, even how we enjoy ourselves, the relationships that we form. Um, so, you know, so th those are my initial thoughts. Okay. No, do you want to come back on that? I, I agree that education is, is one of the most crucial areas in which we can invest for the future. I think one of the greatest problems of our time is that we've been stealing from the future. We have been enjoying things in our present time and deferring costs to the future. And that tends to be very damaging for civilization over, the, over the, um, a long period. And civilization tends to expand and become more robust when people decide to plant trees today, even though they know that they will never enjoy the fruit or nuts of those trees themselves, they'll be uh, long gone and only their descendants will get to enjoy them. And I think that education obliges us to invest in the future through our children and to uh, empower them with new capabilities, perhaps giving them opportunities that we ourselves never had. And that may be one of the best uh, ways to make future society more robust. I agree. Julia, what, what, what were your first reactions to what Nell had to say? Or second, given that you got to hear them earlier in the week? You're muted, Julia. I find myself in agreement with Nell um, and charmed by her use of language, the difference between a revolution and a small scale, did she call it, spirited? Um, Reformation. Spirited? Reformation. Reformation is delightful. And what I particularly like about that is the sense of gentleness of that and the sense of it being rooted in individuals taking gentle, considered action rather than it being an emotional uh, reactivity that comes, um, revolution. And in some of the most violent places I've been have been peace marches actually, where people were very activated with their stuff. So the sense of a small scale, individual, spirited reformation, to me feels really gentle and rooted and grounded, and that action taken perhaps from that place will have a good effect. I guess that raises the question of whether small scale, spirited reformations will be enough to tackle some of the biggest issues we have and the biggest perceived inequalities, or whether it will take, you know, more robust overturning and overhauling of what we have today. Um, Morgan, let's bring you in. What were your reflections on what you heard from Nell? Um, what really grabbed me about what she was talking about was the emphasis on both trading efficiency for resiliency, and we've been focused so much in the last 50 years on building efficiency into the way our marketplace works, the way society works. We've not, we've neglected a lot of the resiliency uh, and we've traded resiliency for efficiency to get the, the last penny out of how things work. Um, and uh, likewise trading uh, tomorrow's earnings for today uh, and taking, not putting a price on externalities is something that we, desperately need to fix and just yeah the, the emphasis on that was really spoke to me um, and i hope that we can get to a better future by fixing those problems uh, 
there we go. Now, does what you've heard from Julia and Morgan spark, spark any more thoughts or reflections from you? I really think that, in a nutshell, um, stop stealing from the future is, is one of the most important memes or ideas that, that we need to, to get out there. Um, that, that it is, is terribly unfair to externalize costs to people all around the world, that it is kind of a mutual trolley problem where everybody's trying to push the trolley onto somebody else. Um, and if we all try to do that, then that assures our mutual destruction. And I think that one of our greatest lessons that we need to learn and internalize in these times is not to do that not to do that to our neighbor and not to do it that to our descendants either, nor other non-human animals for that matter. Excellent. Uh, well, let's share the results of your polling question and see if you've got any reflections on that before we move on. Does the relative weighting of answers surprise you in any way? The institutions come out as the, the best thing we can take away from this? It's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting blend of results. I'm, I would probably have, have clicked the fourth option myself. I find that perhaps the most compelling, um, possibly because the other ones are perhaps predicated upon that having those good institutions. So yeah, yeah, maybe that's one thing that we should all build towards together. Yeah, maybe better institutions are a route to exposing financial chicanery and inequality. Uh, because they're, they're definitely a challenge, I think, that sits at the heart. So thank you very much, Nell. We're going to move on now to our second guest presenter. Uh, so we have Mor Morgan Kaufman. Morgan, please take the floor and share with us the key ideas in your chapter. So uh, my chapter is called This is a Drill, um, Preparing for the Next Pandemic. And I, I spent a lot of the last few years working on public policy, and that's often my default these days when I approach, when I approach a problem. Um, so the thought that grabbed me when I was asked to contribute to this project was, what kind of policy gets put in place after uh, an event like this? Um, for a terrorist attack, it is going to be some sort of security arrangement, uh, security measures put in place to prevent the next one from happening. Um, if it's a financial collapse, then policymakers put in place a uh, a set of banking regulations or something to make it so that that collapse can't happen again. Whether it works or not is another question, but they try to make it look like it can't happen or that they are doing something to prevent it from happening. Um, with a pandemic, there's only two ways to really effectively stop one. You either develop a vaccine and make it so that people can't be infected, or you break the chain of infection and make it so that they won't be infected by simply not coming in contact with someone who has the, pen, the contagion in the first place. Um, barring miraculous developments in how fast we can create a vaccine um, against a new contagion at least, uh, there is going to be a period of isolation and quarantine if we wanna slow the next pandemic down or hopefully stop a cold. Um, so the obvious follow on question is what can we do to make those disruptive measures less disruptive um, and more effective at stopping the spread of a pathogen? Uh, let's just posit that the policymakers are going to make a good faith effort to put in place things that will actually do that job. What does that look like from a citizen's point of view? What does that look like from a policy point of view, at least from you know a thousand foot up, feet up rather than the nitty gritty details? And more practically from my point of view, how do you cram all of that into a single thousand word chapter? Uh, the short answer I would say is fairly simple. If we can't avoid or prevent the disruption, prepare for it build it into the flow of life, make it so that uh, people have the adaptations necessary, both structurally and mentally, in order to be able to adapt to any sudden traumatic event without the trauma or without as much trauma. Um, from my point of view, this means some sort of quarantine drill, uh, a concerted effort to get as many citizens as possible to self-isolate with their families for a set period of time, let's say one month out of every two years. Uh, if people know what they're going to be doing, what they're going to have to do uh, in order to be isolated for a given period, then they build that into their work and family and purchasing habits. Um, if people know what's involved in a quarantine or isolation situation, then there's less panic and disruption when a country is suddenly plunged into one. Uh, no running out and 
buying out all the toilet paper, for example, because you know what you need in order to survive it. Um, then you already hopefully have that in place. Uh, if the measure, if the means to work or to educate or to just live for a month of isolation drill are already in place, then a sudden and unexpected period is when a real pandemic strike strikes isn't the economic calamity that it might otherwise have been. Um, people aren't suddenly having to learn how to do Zoom meetings because people have been figuring that out over the past couple uh, isolation drills, how they can work from home effectively. Um, or companies just adjust and figure out how they can do without specific workers for a period. Um, and just as important, the adaptations necessary to make such a thing actually work from the policy point of view, rather than being a pipe dream or just a plain terrible idea, uh, would be instantly adaptable to a real pandemic rather than just a drill. Uh, if you've got a universal basic income or some kind of uh, uh, wage insurance so that employers are subsidized to keep paying their workers even if they're not working, um, that that means that people can still afford to buy goods um, during the isolation period. Uh, if you've got uh, a supply chain of prepackaged pallets of non-perishable food and toiletries designed to last for a week, a month, whatever, um, if you've got a supply chain of that already in existence, that can be applied to uh, a real pandemic rather than just the drill. Um, likewise, if you've got subsidies already on the books, ready to be sent out to low-income people who can't afford to be in isolation without help, then those subsidies can be immediately put into place when a real pandemic strikes. And it's not just pandemics, though, because this is also applicable to a lot of other disaster scenarios. If a uh, hurricane strikes and wipes out uh, the roads into an area, and you've already got supply chains in and stockpiles of food and supplies for an isolation drill in place, those can be moved to where they're needed. Likewise, if you've got a supply chain out there, outside of this, the affected area, you can move those things much faster than just having to go out and try to find the things that you're looking for, the food, the toiletries, supplies, whatever. If those things are already in existence in prepackaged amounts, you can move that much faster than trying to grab individual things and put them all in a truck or on a cargo, a cargo plane, whatever. Um, add on to that that these uh, adaptations move us further towards being able to help uh, those who are uh, at least able to survive in bad times in general. Um, if you've got uh, adaptations by cities to house the homeless uh, during a, an isolation drill, then that means that they've got those adaptations in place to house the homeless during inclement weather, or even all year long, uh, depending on how much financial backing there is for that. Uh, the point being, it's already in place, it just needs to be expanded. Um, likewise, once you have the overcome the technical and bureaucratic barriers to a basic income for one month, then it becomes far more feasible to do that for an entire year. You've already overcome the hard part. You just need to have the financial backing to support it. Uh, the point isn't that this particular platform needs to be the one that we adopt after this is all over, uh, though I do think it would work uh, if it was done properly. The point is that uh, we need to be building resilience into our society before the next disaster strike rather than scrambling to make ourselves more resilient after the disaster is hit, after the hurricane is hit, after the pandemic is spreading uh, out of control. And if we can manage to build that resiliency in, even if, it, if, it, if it means, and going back to uh, Nell's point, even if it means sacrificing efficiency, if we can build that resiliency in before the next disaster, we'd all be better off for it. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's get everyone up on screen. Uh, move to gallery view. Um, thank you, Morgan. Uh, I guess the, the, the the first question that struck me when I first read your chapter, and, and every time I read your chapter, um, uh, I've read it several times during the edit process, the, the question that comes to me is, how do you start? How do you, even though we've had this pandemic, we have very different views about what it means and how seriously we should be taking it. Brazil announced yesterday, I think it was, that it was going to stop publishing infection and death rates. 
Uh, how do you start the journey to something like the ideas you proposed? In essence, it's, it's a difficult sell. Uh, I'm not going to lie and pretend that otherwise. This is very much a, uh, uh, a hopeful vision of the future rather than a we can do this kind of thing. Um, it, is, it would have to start with a communal decision by policymakers and business leaders, uh, the business community, that this is an unacceptable weakness in the economy and society. Um, the, the thing is that I, this is possibly a failure of imagination on my part, I don't see any other way to prepare for a pandemic other than something like this. Um, and so it would have to come down to a willingness on the part of business to accept a month out of every 24 months of lower productivity in exchange for being able to ensure that this is something that we can deal with. Um, I would also point out that having a hard break in transmission of influenza and other communicable diseases would also improve productivity outside of the isolation period. Uh, just if you can keep people from getting sick and calling in sick because they've got cold or the flu, that would be probably a significant fraction of a percentage of GDP growth every year. But again, this would come down to a combination of measuring out brass tacks, how much this would cost, how much it would gain in terms of being able to create new industries because being able to sell people prepackaged months like this would be expanding the prepper community to the entire country in terms of product development um, because everybody would be a prepper for one month every two years uh, and there would be opportunities there to expand there would be opportunities to uh, make sure that people can like have what they need but it would also be costly and it's a question of priorities if this does lead to a priority shift, if the, a, a lot of this comes down to a, the question of whether policymakers can convincingly tell uh, voters or convince voters that it's all going to be okay next time, or whether voters really want something significant put in place to make it so that the next time isn't as traumatic. Those of us who have lived through this are going to be less affected, hopefully, next time, just in terms of mental anxiety but the economic costs and the effect on those who haven't lived through this uh, are going to be staggering, equally staggering uh, when the next one hits. And it's really a question of whether or not we have the collective will and attention span to demand significant action or whether we just put a Band-Aid on it and hope that it's not as bad next time. I think the, the question of learning is really an interesting one here. So um, I, I wonder to what extent society has learned and would be more open. I, I do worry that the next lockdown, even if it's in a few weeks time, people will take less seriously because they survived this one. You know, they're still around, therefore they must be, you know, made of superhuman stuff. Therefore, let me just go out and do my life in the way I would have done. The other thing I, I wonder about is corporations. In the UK, the airlines were adamant that we shouldn't shut flying down. We shouldn't quarantine people on arrival. And this was back in February when mm -hmm. the scientists, you know, who we keep referring to on our SAGE committee, back in February, they were saying, if we lock this down for a month, uh, we'll be out of this by April because we'll kill it. And the airlines argued against that. Everyone argued against that. And now we have this situation where, you know, a lot of them could end up going bankrupt because this thing could drag on for a very long time. And we may never have that combination of measures in place to, to make people confident to fly enough again. So I, I just wonder to what extent society is really learning from this and, and willing to adapt. Because I think it's a great idea but I just wonder whether the forces of commerce and natural human tendencies might, might stop us going in that direction. And I'm going to bring the rest of the panel in to comment on that, and on your piece, but also their reflections on this. And while we're doing that, I'm going to launch your polling question. 
so that people can be voting on this. There's only one option on this one that you're allowed. The panelists are allowed to vote as well, uh, but you can only choose one answer on this one. So, uh, and this one is about how prepared you think your country would be for another pandemic any time in the next 10 years. Uh, so uh, let's go around. Let's, uh, let's start with you this time, Julia. What, what, what are some of your reflections on what you heard from Morgan? Well, I really like the ideas and I found at the beginning when you were describing that there were two options, either the vaccine or the separation. Um, and I found myself thinking about a third way, which is of um, boosting general health, boosting general immunity. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any reflections on that, but um, um, that's yeah, it's I would like to see things go. 100%. And just in terms of general preparedness for a pandemic, making sure that as many people are as in as good a shape as possible is definitely one of the ways to reduce the death count. Um, the problem is that we can't, it's not a problem with that method in particular. It's just the problem with pandemics is that we can't tell what the next one's going to be. It might be something with a 50% death rate. It might be something with that is just a particularly infectious flu and has uh, the same death rate as the influence as normal influenza is just lasts longer outside the body or it's just more effective at getting into people whatever we can't tell what the next one's going to be and so it might be something that just making sure that people have their vitamins every day is enough to, to stop it but, or it could be something that literally nothing we can do can stop short of a specifically tailored vaccine we don't know and that's what's terrifying about this we frankly got lucky with this with covid because it is a supercharged coronavirus, but it's not something that is instant death to society, uh, which is something that futurists, futurists have been worried about for as long as people have been thinking about this. Um, it's w very much worthwhile and part of the whole trading efficiency for resilience to ensure that the general health of society as, is as high as you can get it. Uh, so 100% agree with you there. Steve, your reflections on Morgan's piece and this idea of whether society is learning. History would kind of suggest to me that um, we'll learn for a bit um, and then we'll forget until the next time and then we'll learn again. Um, and, and actually, the, the, the one example that came to my mind was uh, the, the kind of the peace premium after the Cold War. Uh, because we were kind of immersed in securing ourselves in very expensive ways. And then when the Cold War ended, we released all that money to do marvellous things and completely lost sight of the emergence of non-state actors. Now, I know that's kind of you know, just one example, but you know, historically, it, we, we, do, we react to things that are significant and that have a a specific impact direct on us and then after time we kind of get a nice warm cozy feeling that well it's not happened again so you know so so it's going to be okay the other thing that strikes me about resilience is it depends how many risks that you feel your country lives under so um let's take this parts of the u.s as an example and, and morgan you mentioned hurricanes in other places um in the u.s you have tornadoes we're, and, and so there's an ongoing necessity to have resilience about those kind of events. Um, now, uh, now I'm thinking with a kind of a UK head on, and, and I'm deliberately parking climate change at the moment, but then I'm trying to think, well, actually, why do we need to build resilience because of extreme weather events? Because extreme weather events give us, a, an, a, for if, when it happens to you, it's not this but I, I know but you know we have a little bit of flooding we have some high winds that blow a few tiles off so the requirement for resilience in different countries i think is going to be different and that's almost built into 
the regulatory, the government and the societal cycle and the way that we think about these disruptions. Yes, it would be great, wouldn't it, if uh, we had some kind of resilience plan in place. And I'm sure as a result of this, there will be something in place uh, that follows on through the post-pandemic period. But whether it's still in place, if we don't have another pandemic in 20 years time, my money would be probably not. And it's no, I was, I was compounded, saying. sorry, just one thought. It's compounded because the best way to deal with the pandemic is to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah. Once a pandemic is in the public view, it's already too late. It's going to hit everybody. It's going to go around the world. The only way to stop it is before anyone even realizes that it's a problem. And which means no politician gets credit for stopping it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's classic <laughs> cast, cla catch 22. Sorry, Rohit. No, okay. let's bring Nell in as well on this. Yeah, well, to, to, to come back to, to, to Julia's point about building immunity, I think we are now discovering uh, just how much of a gulf there is in terms of nutrition in society, particularly uh, vitamin D, because so many people with darker skin living in more northern latitudes have a tremendous deficiency in vitamin D. And that leads to all kinds of differences in, in health outcomes. And, you know, supplements can, can help to fix that. And it, it reminds me of, of um, the old days when we used to get, uh, certainly in the United Kingdom, we, we used to get like little bottles of milk and things um, to help build up our bones as young children. And maybe we, we need programs like that again to help to ensure that there is enough vitamin D for everyone in society, um, whether or not they can easily um, generate that from, from a small amount of exposure to a weak northern latitude sun or not. I also consider that a lot of the problems with lack of preparedness can in many ways be beaten by good insurance. I think insurers have a tremendous opportunity to, uh, to say, well, we'll give you premium X if you do such and such. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be X plus a whole bunch more if mm -hmm. you're not willing to take care of those kinds of risks. And I think um, that may make all the difference in how well we are prepared for the next outbreak. However, there's a big problem, and that is a lack of liability um, because of government intervention. For example, a lot of the reason why we've seen so many deaths this year is because they sent a whole bunch of sick older people back into care homes who then infected a whole bunch of more people and that led to a, a tremendous death count. And the people responsible for that the hospital administrators and the care home administrators have generally been given a waiver. They, they are declared not li liable or not able to be prosecuted or litigated for having done that, which I think is, is disgusting and a disgrace. I think that we see similar problems with a lack of liability for police forces um, they also often get a waiver, you know, they are not subject to a, a prosecution, whether that's um, a, a civil prosecution or a criminal prosecution. And I think that needs to change. And if we can end this, uh, this, this free range problem uh, of, of people doing things and, and managing to get off scot-free, then I think we can solve a lot of these problems through insurance. Very interesting. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah. Morgan. Well, oh, also, while just... you're doing that, I'm going to uh, share the results of the poll so you can also comment on the poll results as well. Where do I see that? You should see them on your screen. It is not showing up. I, this is one of the quainter features of Zoom. <laughs> people don't see the poll results. Well, I'll read them out to you. Um, All right. So how prepared do you think your country would be for another pandemic any time in the next 10 years? 0% uh, say not at all. 18% say poorly. Uh, the majority, 55%, say moderately. 
and a very optimistic 27% say their country is well prepared, um, maybe because there's a lot of future thinkers on the, the, the call. 0% uh, say extremely well prepared. Okay. So moderately well. Well, I hope so. Right. Moderately well is still better than what we were before. Um, or at least, sorry, I, I may be viewing this from a US centric point of view. Uh, but yeah. There's a standard distribution if ever I've seen one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> While we're here, while we've got, uh, we've, we've had half the panelists speak, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience now. Uh, and let's just have quick fire answers. If anyone has one, you don't have to answer. Um, they're both from Doha Al Galban, um, who stayed up very late in uh, Dubai, I believe, to, to be part of this. So let's honor her. Um, the first question is, uh, what social hope can we see from an individual perspective and how can new systems help us? Any recommendations on how we can use systems to build social hope? And I think Nell touched on this a little bit, but if, has anyone got any reflections on that? Let's, let's try and keep our answers to sort of 60 seconds or less on this one. Signs of social hope. What, what's out there that gives us encouragement? I mean, I think from, um, the, from the UK perspective, you, you've certainly got this um, very kind of social event, or had this very social event every Thursday evening, where we all went outside and uh, you know and applauded uh, key workers, and that in itself was very nice, but. What I found actually was it became a really interesting and very nice social event for me because over the driveway and over the roof of the car, I was able to talk to my neighbors um, and their kids. Um, and I actually went outside um, with appropriate social distancing and learned to play hopscotch. And as a boy, I've never understood the rules of that until now. So none of those things would have been very, you know, would have been the regular things that I'd have done, particularly the hopscotch. Um, uh, until that came along. So I thought that was really quite an interesting response. And I know I'm not the only one uh, that I speak to that say the social event around that uh, uh, recognizing carers has been something that's been very different and uh, you know, doesn't include any technology at all. Uh, and yet people found it very valuable. For those not from the UK, hopscotch is a game where you put numbers on the paving stones and then you hop from one to the other according to, is it a dice you throw? And then you, you you hop around the stones. It's it, it's an incredibly pointless but hugely fun game to play. <laughs> it was actually invented by Roman soldiers in order to train agility. So okay. we think of it as a as a game for little girls, but it doesn't have to be, not necessarily. Yeah. Excellent. Now I'm really glad I played it, Nell. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else got any thoughts on uh, social policy change? I'm going to throw one in that, that I think. Coming out of the, the whole George Floyd thing, um, it seems to me that there's a, there's a deeper movement at foot now. Uh, if any of you heard Al Sharpton at the memorial service in uh, Minneapolis, I think it was on Thursday, um, probably one of the most powerful speeches I've ever heard. But in the middle of it, he, he talked about how a whole number of civil rights organizations and communities were coming together to really mobilize communities to exercise their voice in the next election, not just for president, but at every level, you know, down to school board and police authorities. And, and that shift, I think, where people are really finding mechanisms where you're not just having rival civil rights organizations arguing amongst themselves, but they're coming together to say, how do we do something bigger? I think that's really encouraging. And then you've seen a number of prominent personalities putting money behind that. And um, who was it? One of the big, uh, um, Michael, was it Michael Jordan? Uh, just put up a hundred million dollars in support of that for the next 10 years to create these self-organizing and self-propelling mechanisms. That to me is a really positive sign that something could happen on a system-wide basis. Um, anyone else got any thoughts on, on that? Otherwise we can take Doa's second question. 
I also think of the micro level of the WhatsApp groups of roads looking out for their neighbours and buying groceries for them. Um, yeah, a very good one. Okay, so let's take Doa's second question, which is, what's one uh, top priority social policy that you think we need to be changing right now in the midst of this recovery um, in order to, to hopefully make a better world? What's, what would be your top social policy priority right now? Let's make it that question. What would be your, your top social policy priority right now? Let's, um, let's start with you, Morgan, as it was your question that prompted this. So aspirationally, I would say a universal basic income. Just make it so everybody using US dollars gets a thousand bucks a month. Um, just as much for a kid as well. It's just you need the help uh, to make sure that they stay fed and clothed. Um, more realistically, given, given the uh, political climate in the US, um, something to assist with uh, folks who can't uh, afford to pay for rent and food, um, rent assistance, uh, whether that's in the form of community-based uh, funds to ensure to distribute as the community sees fit, or whether it's uh, from a more federally managed standpoint, uh, just something to ensure that people can make it out of the uh, uh, pandemic without having to put themselves at unnecessary risk. Um, there's a lot more detail I can get into, but <laughs> that'll take another 30 minutes if I go that detailed. I'm terrible at unmuting myself. Um, who else has got a, a thought on that? Who wants to, else wants to share one top social priority issue we, we should be working on right now? Um, I think for me, one of the things that has come through is transparency. So, you know, what is it that's behind, uh, what are the assumptions behind the decisions that we're making? I think that has to go hand in hand though with a willingness. So I, what I was thinking of there was obviously the, the decisions governments are making. I think that has to go hand in hand with a willingness of the people to allow the government to be able to say, okay, these were the assumptions, but we got that wrong. But through the media, the government is often slated for doing that. So there's kind of a self-perpetuating issue that we have there. Let's be transparent. Oh, we got it wrong. We're going to get slated and we will. So I think that whole piece, what, you know, whatever it looks like, it would be great if that was changed so that governments could feel they could be completely transparent. Excellent. Julia, now, do you have a, a social policy priority that you'd love to see attended to? Uh, for me, it is uh, the earth giving, making sure that um, the plants and uh, the wild spaces are encouraged and respected. Uh, I think that's an important component. I'm not sure it totally fits into social policy, but uh, that would be a priority for me because I believe it benefits everybody. And now you get the last word on this one then. Well, a little bit of, of, of what I've said before, you know, one, one great shorter term intervention might be a reform of drug policy. And then the longer term, investing in mechanisms for enabling better accounting of shifted costs and externalities. And I've got a little website at pacha.org, P-A-C-H-A.org, where I'm collecting some examples of organizations that are starting to do that, that are beginning to um, do this in small, isolated ways. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity to start to connect this together so that we can embed externalities and the tracking and accounting for them within our economics. And I think that's a fundamental missing link that is um, required in order to get us to the next level of sustainable civilization. Fabulous. Okay. Well, I think it's time to hand over to Julia to talk about her chapter. Julia, the floor is yours. Let's spotlight your video and we're off. Thank you. The world is in trouble.
at every level, globally, collectively, nationally, locally, and individually, it's clear that the old way we've been living is not the way that will sustain us into the future. The challenge now is for us all to recognize the error of our ways. Many of us thought that what we had was good. We enjoyed fast cars, food and coffee, fancy devices and clothes. But in our pursuit of profit, we ignored suffering of our own bodies when we were exhausted and upset. We ignored the suffering of other people on the other side of the world, on the other side of town. We ignored the pain of other beings at the end of our garden. We ignored whatever was getting in the way of our so-called success. We kept on keeping on. Now that the old normal has been halted, can we accept that the way we were doing life was not really working? Can we admit that we'd lost our way as a culture, a society, a civilization? The difficulty in waking up is that a greater assumption of responsibility is required. It's a step up. It's much easier to slob out, to not bother showering, not bother washing up, not cleaning the bathroom, hoovering, not picking up our litter. Collapse is much easier than growing up. It's the easiest way, but is it the most rewarding way and is it the easiest way, medium to long term? For individuals, the healing process always begins with an acknowledgement of what is. Sometimes that's a painful symptom, a shoulder, a headache, a diagnosis of cancer or an argument with someone. Pray, pain prompts us to find a solution. Seeing the red of spilt blood is shocking. It spurs us to action. There's no doubt the world needs a new solution now, a new way of doing things. It takes motivation, support and strength to look at things, to see how things are and to feel how we're affected. It takes courage to realize that we're vulnerable, that we can't cope alone that we need to reach out to others and ask for their help. In my chapter, I write about the solution beginning with the acknowledgement that the old way was not working, was not fit for purpose. As a therapist and facilitator working with countless clients over many years, time and again, I've seen that the restoration of health comes from tuning into addressing, inviting change at the level underneath the surface symptoms. In the physical body, a pain, a symptom or a disease is a call for action, for attention. And usually someone takes notice after many similar cries for help have previously been ignored. Symptoms keep getting stronger until attention is paid. Many people, including my mum, have told me that their cancer was the best thing that ever happened to them. The disease was a wake-up call that they heard. They changed their way of life, realising and discovering things that they'd been insensitive to before. Obviously, not, everyone's who, not everyone who's unwell is able to turn it around. It takes tremendous motivation, support and courage to make deep and sustained change. And it is possible. There are a great many people who have made such profound and positive changes in their lifetime. And now we're all being called to do this. And the way forward, I believe, is through reconnection to ourselves, to each other and to the earth. In practical terms, how do we reconnect? We bother. So to connect with ourselves, let's try it now for a moment. Can you feel your feet on the ground? Can you feel your bottom on the chair? Can you feel the breath through your nose? Can you feel your arms and legs? Through slowing down and being more sensitive, 
we can do the thing that we feel is the right thing to do in our hearts, despite our ideas and thoughts of what we ought to do. We reconnect by trusting ourselves as worthy people, by listening to ourselves. Reconnecting to each other. There are many different kinds of people who've been marginalized. There's a whole long list I could give. Reconnecting is intending to treat other people with care, kindness and respect. And reconnecting with the earth, let's appreciate the plants and the insects, the rocks and the trees. Can you feed drowsy bees with a little honey so they've got enough energy to fly away? Or save earthworms from being too dry in the summer by spitting on them? Or after the rain, save them from being trodden on by moving them carefully from the pavement to the grass? What is the cost-benefit analysis of these tiny actions? Are they worth bothering with? Even if a bit inconvenient, isn't the bigger benefit worth us slowing down to achieve them? A small, single act can have a huge positive reverberation on everything else. Let's tell ourselves a different story now. Instead of a story of competition, let's talk about the benefits of collaboration. Let's acknowledge the sacred, praising the sun and the moon, the wind and the rain, the earth under our feet, and appreciating the small pieces of good fortune amongst the difficulty being humble when we realize we're none of us the authors of our own lives. We're all being moved by forces much, much bigger than us at play. Thank you, Julia. Well, let's, um, let's get your polling question up and let's also get the others into the conversation. Let's get your polling question up while we're, uh, where are you? There you go, Julia. Okay. Um, this is a multiple choice question. And the question is, what do you think is one small thing that you can do differently? Actually, it says multiple choice, but it should be one thing. So only choose one option here, people. I, uh, what's one thing that you can do differently to, that could have a tiny positive impact on the world? Uh, so please only choose one option out of the eight available. And while we're doing that, let's, uh, let's take the, the panel's reactions, but I'm gonna, as the moderator, I'm gonna steal the chance to ask the first question. You, you talked about this being a, a crisis of responsibility in some respects, in people not stepping up. What is it that you think is, is that magic kind of ingredient that leads to people stepping up, whether it's creating that small local community app or you know, bringing food round to your neighbor or getting onto the streets to protest. What is it that moves people to step up? Uh, and what can we do to amplify that? A great question, thank you. I think that um, when people are resourced enough, when they've got enough, when they feel loved enough, when they feel safe enough, then they uh, feel able to take, um, in essence, an extra step. When they're exhausted and depleted, really everything is too much and all they can do is, is collapse or lash out. So the more that we can smile at strangers down the street, not in some fake way, but in some genuine response to the person that we see walking towards us. The more that we can, I don't know, any, any small um, thing that each of us can do will have a ripple effect on, on everybody else. When um, we're living in such a way that many people are depleted, it will be hard for them to to step up. So we need to collectively take care of each other. Okay. Let's take reflections from the other panel members. Let's, um, let's start with you this time, Morgan. I, I, and I'm having to get myself out of the public policy mindset because there's, there's answers to a lot of this and it doesn't get to the heart of her point. 
Um, I suppose how how does one talk to someone who doesn't come from a place of privilege, who who isn't who is in that state of exhaustion and being pushed too much? How do you talk to someone who how how can you talk to them and ask them? show them that it is possible to take that extra step to make the world a better place and despite their world being a dark and terrifying one. How can you ask that? There's something to do with not turning it into a them and us. Oh, let's bring Nell in. Sorry, Morgan, your, your voice was breaking up there a bit. So let's oh, no. Up. Shoot. All right. I really liked the questions on that, Paul. They were, they were quite simple things, like just, just enjoying a bird's song. And I, I personally chose to share a smile. Because funnily enough, I've sometimes been wandering around a foreign city or maybe entering a, a neighborhood that, that I haven't been before and I don't necessarily feel a kinship with those people and yet somebody will, will just smile at me in the street and suddenly they, they turn from a two-dimensional person into a three-dimensional being. Like I, I see them as a human and, and not just as some sort of moving bipedal object, you understand? And, and sometimes those little opportunities to remind each other of our essential humanity, um, that really helps to build empathy in society. That really helps to uh, create a more forgiving and forbearing society. And that is so important today when passions are uh, aroused in, in various ways and people are perhaps somewhat motivated to not see each other in the most charitable of ways. So I think having an opportunity to chill out, to disconnect from the digital and return to our natural innocence, I think that's one of the most important aspects of building a happier society today. Steve, what's your take on what you heard from Julia? Uh, two reflections for me, really. One is, I think it's important to be self-aware of what's within our span of control. Um, uh, then beyond that, what we might be able to influence with the right tactics, the right relationships. Um, and then there's all this kind of other stuff that happens completely outside our control. And I think we have to remember um, uh, you know, those three areas and perhaps focus our energies um, appropriately. Uh, and the other reflection is on collaboration. And I hear collaboration a, a lot everywhere. It's almost like it's fashionable to think about collaboration. But the thing I always say when I talk to people about collaboration is let's be absolutely clear what we mean because collaboration incorporates every, everything from some degree of coordination through a greater degree of cooperation through then what I think of as collaboration, potentially then through to partnership and ultimately through to merger. So we can use the word collaboration, but I think when we actually collaborate, then we need to be crystal clear about what we mean by that and therefore what are the appropriate behaviors what are the appropriate investment and that investment may be time but it may also be money it may also be resources we have to be really clear what we mean by that because within collaboration there's plenty of room for misunderstanding uh, go ahead Julie. can i respond um I really like what you say, Steve. And of course it is that um, it's not just about defining it, it's also about communicating it. Because even with the best of intentions, it's so easy, we all know that, for a conversation to go off track. So um, 
it is about uh, being resourced enough to be patient and being skilled enough to have a conversation um, so that we can uh, navigate different landscapes and navigate different feelings and navigate uh, when someone else has a slightly different opinion to us and still maintain the conversation and the relationship and the collaboration. Let's share the polling results and get your take on those. Anything surprise you there? It, it delights me. I'm really moved to see it. It's um, charming. Um, I have, I mean, it's, you know, it's lovely. The, um, yeah, it's really very lovely um, to see. And no one answer from my point of view is better than any other answer. They're all lovely things to do. Very even distribution other than sensing your body, which uh, obviously our participants today don't really think that that's part of the story. Uh, but fascinating to see those. Let's, um, let's move on now to the final panelists, uh, Steve Wells, who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. He's been a co-editor of the book with me, manfully spent nine weeks reading, editing, rereading, editing, proofreading, copy editing, uh, <laughs> get the beast to market. So Steve, what are you going to talk to us about? Well, what I'm going to say, first of all, which, which is something that I said right at the beginning of, of, of one of the pieces that I did on, on the first, and that is, uh, because I think it's important that it's always a privilege to read the ideas that people have articulated. And that's true of um, all of us that are in this book uh, and all those that are going to be in the next book as well, uh, because, you know, there's passion, uh, there's uh, motivation, there's all these things in the ideas that, that people write. So I, I, I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the chapter navigating a new landscape. I want to do three things. I want to set up a, a little bit of context that won't take very long. I want to go through the things that uh, resonate really strongly with me. Uh, and I want to try and pick out some of those things that connect with issues that other people have spoken about. Uh, and then finally, I just want to kind of tie it together with, uh, with a couple of observations. So I think in terms of setting the context, that the question that we were looking to answer through this chapter was what reasonable assumptions can we make about the kinds of global post-pandemic shifts that could take place for governments, society, individuals, businesses, and markets over the next few years. And when we start to think about that question, then for me, there are kind of six broad things that, that, that come to mind. One is just the pure complexity of what we're facing. So the pandemic has spread all over the world, all over the planet. And there's growing understanding that actually the cure to this from an economic and a social perspective may take much longer, is likely to take much longer than the pandemic itself. But I think we have to put that in the context of the other underlying trends we were facing anyway. So our world was increasingly complex. It was increasingly uncertain. The, the na very nature of globalization was being challenged. The idea that um, the, the way that economics, the way that trade works, the way that politics works, the way that there's unease and conflict and tension throughout the world was all factored into how we've experienced the pandemic so far. I think the second thing is just thinking about how we actually develop resolutions, how we develop ideas, how do we develop sustainable um, mechanisms that allow us to come through the pandemic and do some of the things that we've all been speaking about this evening. So making them sustainable, making them human focused, making sure that what we put in place seeks to um, present solutions to issues of, in of inequality. And I think one of the really nice templates that we can use when we start to think about these resolutions are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I think the pandemic has presented us with kind of a, a, a question really and the question is about restoring the old order or thinking about a total system reboot 
And we've spoken both already this evening about the opportunities for a system reboot, but also some of the challenges that represents and the sense that actually some kind of safe and comfortable and familiar restoration of the old order would be kind of really nice. And we'd be comfortable with that because we understand and we know how that feels. But I think that needs to challenge our organizational DNA. So how can we stop doing the things that we've always done because all we'll do is get what we've always got? And how can we switch that into understanding how we create a new game, how we create new rules, how we actually take the gift of a crisis and create a better future for humanity? The next theme I want to talk about is the, uh, the theme of trust and transparency. And I guess the love for facts is something that we've been increasingly finding as we've gone through the pandemic, not just the, the cruel and, and, and harmful numbers about the infections and the death rate, but also, as I said earlier on, the assumptions, the underlying assumptions that help us understand and have some clarity about the policy and the actions that governments and other authorities have taken to help us through the pandemic. We've also spoken a bit this evening about, uh, about government response. And it's quite interesting how the different responses by different governments all around the world have reflected a different sense of preparedness, a different sense of how the emerging emergency has not exactly crept up on us, but, but how it's taken such a chunk out of our normal daily lives, how it's really affected everyone uh, throughout the world. And I think what's really quite interesting about that is the resilience piece seems to have come up to now from populations adhering to the regulations around lockdown and so on. So I think it does begin to question what we need to do in the future. And Morgan's chapter is really nice in looking at one of the ideas that there may be. So what are the things of resilience around, as we've discovered through the uh, through the pandemic of PPE, but also um, testing infrastructure and testing capacity to meet the demand. The last thing that I want to talk about is, is then this notion of how do we actually build resilience? And resilience, resilience is in part the government, the public response to a pandemic or other kind of uh, major disruption, natural disaster. But it's also about the commerce and the enterprise response, about the robustness of supply chains, of how we move product about when particularly air transport is down, because we suddenly realize how crucial to economic prosperity and, and just the mechanisms of economics the air transport sector is. So when factories closed down for a couple of weeks in February in China, all of a sudden products weren't available all around the world. And now all of a sudden we're finding new ways to source products that we need, whether it's the manufacturer of PPE in the UK for the UK health and social care sector, whether it's new ideas and the creation of new types of ventilation for use within the health service and the health system. So the resilience exists not just at the governmental level, but also at the enterprise level. And the other aspect of resilience here is, I think, how we keep people engaged, how we, peep, how we continue to allow people, even in the context of lockdown, to live some degree of a fulfilling life. So what I've done there is kind of laid out what I think are some of the really pertinent, interesting and, and significant aspects um, within this particular chapter. And I'd just like to close by just thinking about a couple of things. And first of all, this, this chapter is just, uh, in total, eight powerful shifts. It's a horizon scan of eight powerful shifts, and I've kind of mashed some of them, some of them together. But these shifts could really radically reshape every aspect of life, society, and business. And my final observation about navigating a new landscape is we've been here before. Throughout human history, we've actually always progressed, and we've tended to always progress more at the point of a major disruption. So I'm really actually quite confident that as a result of this, humanity will progress a bit more. Our governments will come up with new ideas. As I said earlier on, perhaps some of those ideas will peter away as the risk disappears into the rearview mirror. But I'm really confident that actually we find a way to make 
the world better because up till now we always have done thank you thank you steve let's uh, take you off the spotlight and put everyone back on screen uh let's launch your polling question and while we're the audience is answering your polling question uh, and this is a multiple choice one so you have uh, a bunch of options about around what are the critical lessons governments should learn to navigate the crisis um, I'm going to ask you uh, to have a Sophie's choice here, Steve. If you were to pick from that list of eight shifts that we talk about, which is the one that you think, from your perspective, could have the biggest positive impact on society? Uh, and just to say to everyone who's responding to the participants, you can vote for all of the options if you want in Steve's question. You don't have to just pick one. Um, please. So, so the really interesting one for me is 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 this idea of uh, do we stick or do we twist? So it's the restoring um, uh, the old order or the total system reboot. And I think what's really fascinating for that is it really gets the to the to the crux of something that I, I find absolutely fascinating as, as a futurist. So as a futurist, I like to kind of create plausible scenarios for people to think about how the future may change. And that may be the result of new technologies, but it may also be the result of different attitudes, the way consumer views are changing, uh, the way that demographics are changing, how um, the aging population is responding to a particular issue. But I think quite often when we think about these issues, the first hurdle we have is about mindset. And our mindsets are really about this, you know, do we stick with what we've got or do we actually try to do something different? And it's really hard, isn't it, to actually take a new mindset and do something different when what we've done in the past has been so successful. And there are lots of examples around the world as to how uh, different organizations have chosen to actually stick with what they know. So Kodak inventing a digital camera and popping that into, a, into their bottom drawer so it didn't cannibalize their film business or Blockbuster choosing not to accept um, a partnership invitation from Netflix. So, you know, there are really interesting examples of what happens when you choose not to change. I think what that then leads on to is actually notions of leadership. So how do we actually change the kind of skills that we need in order to make sense of the opportunities that present ourselves? And actually what we're talking about there, or what I'm talking about there, is a new, um, a new combination of skills so how do we use foresight to inform how the future might change? Not so that we can put you know, all our chips on, on, one, um, you know, on, on one bet right now, but actually so we can build resilience, fle flexibility and adaptability into what we do. Um, how do we become more empathetic with people that we're working with or we're interacting with? Because actually, one of the things that's happening as we go through the pandemic is so much insecurity, uh, you know, so much... Um, unconfidence, so much uncertainty about how the future may play out. But I think it's really important from all, for all sorts of reasons, reasons, not least mental health, that we actually have a way of engaging with people so that actually we can help them come to terms with uncertainty and, and in, increasing complexity. Thanks. I'll stop, otherwise I'll go on for the next hour. <laughs> well, you might, but there won't be many people with you after. <laughs> Now, yeah, let's get some reactions from you to both what Steve's just said, but also the, the broader picture of, of shifts that he painted for navigating our way through this. Yeah, we are, we are definitely at a, at a very critical juncture. And sometimes at a moment like this, there, there are opportunities to to, to use the momentum of the moment in order to take a leap ahead further than otherwise might be possible. I do think that it could be very valuable to have a government which is more confident in, in making experimentations. It would be lovely to see governments be a lot more transparent about their policies. For example, we saw the examples of um, the CDC and the surgeon general telling people not to wear masks which led to a great deal of loss of public trust um, you know probably a, a significant 
aspect of them of them giving that advice was because there weren't enough around and they didn't presumably want people to panic when they couldn't get them and then inevitably they they were obliged to uh, to change their mind and i think incidents like that are tremendously damaging for for the trust between the public and the state and so if we can we can come to some sort of a detente between government and journalism and media to enable the government to have more transparency, but to be more forgiving with the government um, if some of their experiments go wrong, then I think that would be a much healthier culture. So I completely agree with Steve. Excellent. Julia, what, uh, what struck you? Uh, well, there's lots to be struck by in what he was saying. And I was particularly struck um, with the talk of enterprise and uh, creativity and innovation. And I think that absolutely we don't know, but I do think that um, human beings are amazing. And uh, I do hope that we will come up with some amazing solutions at individual and small organization levels. Right. Morgan. Morgan. Um, just following on, is my auto audio working? Yeah. This time. All right. Following on with what Julie was saying, uh, how just the the difference between bottom up solutions and top down solutions? Because it's a completely different dynamic. If you can change the rule set from the top, you can change how the incentive structures of society work, how much you put a price on risk and uh, externalities and all that stuff. But how? going back to what Nell said about, uh, this, this time it's me forgetting what, uh, what it was, the, the small scale um, reformations, um, how much of an impact does widespread uh, lower level change, how much can that work up to cause a societal shift? Just the difference to going back to what now can that work out to cause in top down and bottom up is the intriguing factor to me uh, in terms of what will eventually lead to systemic change, we hope. <laughs> we'll one day learn to unmute before I start talking. <laughs> it's only 400 webinars in, so you know, give me time. Um, uh, any reflections on what you just heard, Steve? Yeah, I, I think picking up on what Morgan was talking about there, I always think that's an interesting challenge, the kind of the, what, whichever, whichever ones we use, top down, bottom up, um, at local and national. And actually, neither one or the other, is it? It's both. <laughs> and, and one of the things, I, that's one of the things that I often talk to people about in terms of the use of foresight. So it's great to come up with plausible scenarios, but unless you can actually show how they connect back to, the, to where we are now, then, you know, they're not plausible, they're not believable. So I think that, you know, that, that's the skill, I suppose, in bringing both those things together. I, but um, like Julia, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that humanity, almost because it always has, hasn't it, um, uh, will come up with something. But I think, you know, without kind of blowing our own trumpet, books like this, events like this, are some of the things that play a role in that because it actually helps create the debate about the choices that exist for us um, uh, as we look towards the future. Absolutely. And um, I, one of the things that, you know, after we wrote it, that really resonated with me more and more over the last few weeks was this point about facts. Uh, there is a public outcry now saying, just give us the information. Let us see what the science is that you're looking at. And also give us the frames of interpretation you're using. So tell us what lens you're looking at the science through. Because science isn't one amorphous map. It's, you know, it's not like basic arithmetic where all science comes to the same conclusion. You know, we know there's raw data. We know there's models. We know there is assumptions in the models. We know the assumptions drive the weightings on the parameters in the models. You know, there's so much at play here. And, and, I think it's really quite a negative thing to say the public won't understand that. I think it's far better to put it out there and see how much the public can understand. Yeah. And then where there is a lack of understanding, have more clarity, have more 
uh, debate and explanation about why there are six different views from six different experts so that people understand that um, this isn't just a hard answer that says, you know, gravity is X. You know, this is not the same with a lot of the science we're dealing with, with a pandemic, where it, you know, it, ultimately a lot of it is just competing opinions about how it might spread according to the model you happen to use and the data you're placing more emphasis on. And, and, I, and it would also highlight, you know, where the failings are in our education system. And, I, you know, one of the things I would credit the media with is I think the media are getting very good at explaining the basic data and the basic science. Um, and, and just constantly at the ad breaks, I noticed that Sky News, you know, has a little explanation of different parts of the science, you know, whether it's distancing or whatever. I think that's so important because we, we need a society that gets this. Because if we think this is hard, imagine when we're dealing with the climate crisis where we've got you know 10 times more variables we're dealing with multiple more perspectives on what it could all mean we you know this is a dress rehearsal for something much bigger uh let's um let's share uh sorry you're welcome to come back on that as well steve but let's share the results of your poll Ooh, a three-way tie. Yeah. Better infrastructure, more domestic manufacture, and more talking to people about what's going on. Not a bad list. Not a bad list. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm quite encouraged by that. One of the reasons I'm quite encouraged by that is um, those were the three that I would have chosen in my own poll. <laughs> For some reason, that last option's come up twice. Well, I know what reason, which is I typed it in twice. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> there's, oh, there's yeah. magic there. It's just a basic human error. I don't, I don't know what the last option should have been. But yeah, um, I think learning is a really important one. Um, and, and what's interesting for me about those is those, are, those, those, those top three, although it, <laughs> they're the top three, <clears throat> they're all things that we've particularly been talking about, aren't they? About the, the, the public role that, um, I mean, we haven't used specifically the words, the, the investment in critical national infrastructure, but um, the government and public role in some of these things that help society work, um, the ability to build resilience um, into product and services that we need through periods of, uh, of, of massive disruption. And as we were just talking about, facilitated public dialogue um, about you know, the underlying assumptions to the models, but also I think the way that future shocks might, uh, might emerge. And uh, yeah, I, that feels, as I say, the, the, the three that I would have picked if I were taking my own poll. Okay. I think going back to one of the things you were talking about just now about the media over here, I, I, do, I do think there's something else that needs to change. And, and the media's had a really difficult job to do as well. But if we just take one example, <clears throat> the temptation for much of the media to sen sensationalize um, an outlier, uh, I think is still something that we need to bake into the whole debate about um, the role that media has. Because if one or two people out of the UK scientific advice committee that the government is using to help them develop policy. You know, they'll focus on the one or two dissenting voices um, rather than the underlying agreement that there is, which underpins the, social, the, the government policy. So there is still something that needs to happen about desensationalizing um, some of the scientific opinion, which can vary as, as we've just said. We just need to make sure that it's appropriately balanced so that people do get, um, you know, the, the appropriate information put in front of them. And I think it is fine to say that there is varying scientific evidence or varying scientific uh, opinion, um, but uh, we, we just need to make sure, we just need to be careful that we don't sensationalise it. And I think sometimes the media is very guilty of that. Uh, well, that, that raises another interesting point, which is um, the impression is given that these, you know, overlords of uh, virology and epidemiology uh, or overlords and over mistresses emerge and, and they kind of sit there in their power thrones and they you know they come up with an answer uh, 
and you know there's a big glowing ball in the middle of the room that you know reflects what the number was um or there's a puff of white smoke having chaired yeah, i used to run the foresight program for defra i chaired these scientific communities about once every four yeah, committees about once every four weeks on different topics and the reality is if you've got six people there you've got 14 different opinions uh, and and you know your your job as the civil service uh, and and the you know the government agents there is you have to take the minutes, you have to pull out what people have said, you test whether there's agreement to any of the things that are said, and then you go back and you try and create a coherent statement out of what they've said, and the idea that you know Sage would somehow reverse seventy years of scientific policy committees and come up with a single view i think is completely denying how science works and completely ignoring the fact that all of these people are professors running epidemiology or virology clinics or you know centers in their university and one of the big things hanging over their head is have i got enough money have i raised enough money to keep my department going for the next three years so that you can't separate what they're advising from what they think they should be funded to be doing research on. And I think we need a bit more explanation of all of that yeah. because these are not, you know, these are, these are people who've learned to be politically astute. You know, I'd love to know what the people at Oxford said so that, you know, Boris keeps sending around the big black vans with more 10 pound notes in them you know, for whatever they're doing. You know, that Boris has announced about three different dollops of money to them. I'd love to know what the conversation is that they've had that all the other institutes haven't managed to get the same kind of funding. And, and so I think we, you know, we, we have to be very careful as well to explain how all this stuff works and to explain what these committees do and how they work and to put out the minutes completely redacted is pointless, you know, cause it doesn't tell you anything. You know, you, you, you spend your whole time trying to make sense of the odd word in a sentence that hasn't been cut out. And if that word happens to be and or the, it's not that helpful. Um, I'm, we, I'm very conscious of time. So I'm going to let you go, Steve, and then we're going to go around the panel. We've also got a couple of questions that I'm going to throw up. Um, so, Steve, we're going to let you have a, a, a final word on this, and then we're going to take some uh, yeah. questions. I mean, one of the things that struck me was the, this kind of parent-child relationship between government and, um, and the population. That's, that seems to me the kind of thing that we've been talking about. And I'm just wondering which is the right system. And I'm just going to leave it hanging. So um, a democracy or a dictatorship? Or a benign dictatorship. Or a benign dictatorship, yeah. So. Right. Uh, let's take some of the participant questions. So we're going to start with Thomas Mengel's question. Are we getting any closer to the end of neoliberalism? Anyone want to have a go at that? The looks on your faces are, hmm, maybe not. <laughs> Anyone got a view on that? I, I we... would like... Yeah, go on. Go, go ahead, go Morgan. No, go ahead, Morgan. I, I would like a definition of neoliberalism first, because that's... I follow a number of uh, professed neoliberals on Twitter, and it's not clear even to them. So... Before I opine on whether we're close to the end of it, I need a definition, please. You she drove it. You're <laughs> reading my lips, though. Yeah. I I do think that that neoliberalism has has been very effective in, as we've we've mentioned before, as a group. In increasing efficiency in society, you know, and it's been it's been one of the the driving forces behind our increase in efficiency. However, neoliberalism is not necessarily that good at understanding shifted costs and externalities and uh, how lots of things which look profitable on paper may actually be robbing Peter to pay Paul and maybe um, destroying all kinds of value that is not being accounted for. And so, yes, I would like to see something, 
something that that perhaps blends some of the best elements of neoliberalism with the reforms necessary to do proper accounting of these more intangible costs. Anyone else want to have a go? Thank you, Neil. Anyone else want to have a crack at that? I mean, I guess simplistically for me, the response, some of the government responses has already started to challenge that. I guess right now, no one has actually worked out what the end is. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, um, the uh, furlough support, um, uh, the small business support, the government's response for loans, you know, all this kind of stuff, all these provisions that have been put in place to ensure that there is an economy to come back to after the pandemic, it's kind of um, really challenge the way that we think um, capitalist, capitalism should work. Um, but we just don't know quite what the answer is. But it feels like this could be a good point to um, introduce some um, uh, new modified ideas to change the way that uh, society works from an economic perspective in the future. Julian? I guess I come back to inclusivity. And it seems that neoliberalism... Um, left a lot of people out and we need to include everybody because everybody's important and um, yeah something to do with uh, putting in place again local small-scale um, structures with slightly different values or that operate in a different way that's not just about money so that people can still be supported and uh, get and give what they need uh, but it's not only about money yeah i mean I'd, I'd sort of build on all of those i think no one sat down and wrote a kind of treatise on neoliberalism at the start of it in the same way as you know karl marx kind of set down the agenda that became the basis of communism or you know we look at John Maynard Keynes as laying down the basis of kind of the capitalist economy no one did that it, it kind of happened by accident it was a set of decisions policies that over the last you know 20 to 40 years shaped how the world worked a set of assumptions about what we were in pursuit of which was largely money and and rendering everything to an economic measure so we started to value ecosystem services. It was one of the things that almost made me cry at DEFRA when people had debates about the value of a tree. And you know, it was like, really? You know, this is, we're now at this point where we're trying to value everything and determine whether or not it should exist purely based on its economic contribution. And I think all those things worked where everyone was going in the same direction we were telling developing nations to shut up and follow us. And if they just did what we did, take the money that we gave them, trickle down, we'd all go the same direction. I think that whole model is now completely broken. Uh, it just hasn't fallen apart completely yet. You know, so it is a broken model, it, but it's somehow hanging together just about. And, and so if you want to call it neoliberalism, you can call it that. I, I just think it's late stage capitalism and the model and the assumptions no longer hold true for at least five billion on the planet and therefore if you want an all-encompassing model it has to be inclusive and it has to recognize the states of development the very different political philosophies the very different societal needs the very different level of capacity and infrastructure and there's no point talking about yemen or syria or afghanistan as though they're boston they're not. And, you know, no amount of trying to apply what would work in a Western nation to those countries, would work, which is why so many of the attempts to impose democracy, the way we think democracy works, have failed. So, you know, I think we are at the end of, if you want to call it neoliberalism, we're at the end of it. It might take another 30 years to die, but it, it feels like the system needs change. Okay, last question. I'm going to give you each a minute on this one. Uh, this is from anonymous attendee who seems to come to a lot of events. Um, uh, really cruel of their parents as well to call them anonymous. Uh, sorry, my humour gets no better. Um, 
the lack of liability that Nell spoke about is leading to a breakdown of trust in power. How can institutional holders of power be dismantled and rebuilt when money is power and there is limited motivation for change? A nice easy one to end on. Who wants to go first? You have your minute. How do we dismantle institutions? I, I'm gonna start, I'll give you 10 seconds. How do you start? By starting. You just take some of the institutions and you break them down, like the incredible stuff that's happening in the US right now about just saying, let's dismantle our local police force. Let's not try to change that police force. Let's set up a wholly new one with a wholly new set of values, beliefs, responsibilities, and behaviors, and then let's train according to that. I, I think that's incredible. Given that you've got 80,000 police forces in the US, which was a number that blew my mind. But I, I, I think you stop talking about it and you start experimenting. You just start trying new institutions. So there you go. Uh, who, want, who wants to follow? What else do we do? Morgan. Um, just going with what you said, uh, Camden, New Jersey has been held up in multiple op-eds by this point as a, an example of a city in the US that just said, nope, this is too corrupt, this is too brutal, you're all fired building a new police force um, it's it's still police but it's drastically changed in terms of priority and ability to interact with the, uh, the society of the community um, much Which, more limited in terms of Camden New Jersey I believe I'm be getting the city wrong but um, and just there's so many built-in privileges and uh, rules that this there's 200, 200, 300 years of history in the U.S. of building that kind of privilege for power structures, especially centered around race. Um, and weeding those out doesn't necessarily need to be breaking down the institution canon and replacing it entirely, but taking out, ripping out uh, the qualified immunity, for example, which is an entirely undemocratic thing. It was put in place by judges. Um, that completely protects police officers from prosecution um, and just not even being able to sue them for damages because the city covers that cost rather than the police officer themselves. Uh, changing the incentive structure, ripping that out, uh, it doesn't happen without a significant impetus. We were building towards that uh, with regards to the police uh, oppression. Taking out Bringing out uh, police uh, brutality and immunity to prosecution. We were building towards that over the last few years. We can completely protect. Um, and I'd like to think that, like to think that with another four years, without uh, a spark uh, like George Floyd's death was, uh, we might have achieved. It doesn't happen. We've some sort of completely protect uh, with regards to the police uh, democratic means, but with this. This kind of spark set a blaze that has been, fuel has been burning. It has been building up in the forest for a long time. Um, and we're going to see change. The question is whether it's going to be enough. Um, not sure whether that completely answered the question, but okay. I've used my minute. It doesn't happen just through different means, but with this, this kind of spark set a blaze and then some. Great. I'm very conscious of time, so Julia, you think that with another. The question is whether it's going to be enough. Um, do they... Okay, um, I didn't quite hear the last bit. I trust is important. Um, uh, Julia, your minute on how do we how do we start to dismantle, rebuild institutions? Well, I don't know, but I do like what you were saying, Rohit, about starting again and experimenting, and. Um, perhaps the most important thing is to listen, is to listen to each other, especially to listen to people uh, that are most different from us, and especially to listen to our own bodies, not just the contents of our minds, our um, pre-programmed thoughts. So to listen to our bodies, to listen to each other, listen to the birds that I can hear outside, listening. Very much agree. Steve? The thing that strikes me is 
how much good could we do in creating more of a debate about both the future that we want and the future we might want to protect ourselves against by mainstreaming foresight? Excellent, excellent. You heard it here first. Nell. Having better accountability is going to be absolutely key to reining in the worst excesses of our current societal institutions. There are many challenges with that, particularly when, as, as Morgan said, there are democratic laws in place which have granted immunity to prosecution to certain individuals. But I think we do have opportunities also due to social media, due to smartphones, etc. We can create a kind of a public panopticon. We can shine a spotlight on wrongful actions whether or not they end up being criminally prosecuted. I think that's a start. And I think that with sufficient momentum, we can undo some of the um, liability protections which have been given to governments as well as corporations and corporate boards. And I think um, we may see a wave of uh, undoing some of that immunity in the years to come. Thank you. Well, that's been a fascinating evening's conversation. Thank you all for your presentations. Thank you to all the participants for coming along and asking questions. And thank you to the panelists for covering such a diverse range of topics that were in many cases way off the thing that you were here to talk about. But it's been really fun, really uh, diverse, really wide ranging. And just uh, my final um, reminder to everyone, the book is out. Do buy it. Do tell your friends if you're enjoying these conversations. We're having these every Sunday evening for the next few weeks. So come along, tell people to come along. And um, yeah, um, uh, tell your friends about them if you like the, the, the conversations and tell your friends about the book if you like the ideas that we're sharing. See you all at some point in the future and thank you very much for coming. Good evening. Thank you all. It's been uh, great having you. And uh, I shall Likewise. Re release you back into the community now to <laughs> whatever is going to happen to you for the next few hours uh, before the sun comes down. So thank you all. You're, you are now hereby released from your commitments around talking about the book. We will get the keynote theatre going at some point, probably in a couple of weeks' time. There you'll be able to talk about whatever you want. And you don't have to do that, but it's just our way of creating a platform for you. Great. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you, Steve. Right. Very welcome. Thank you both. And thank you to Alexandra, wherever she is. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Bye. Have a good one. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>